Fire is lapping at the last room where 10 desperate men wait for their chance to escape. The defenders are crowded into a crumbling room, actually the kitchen of a burning house. The walls are too hot to touch and they ooze acrid smoke. The men are blackened, tired, thirsty, and desperate. At approximately 9 p.m., five of them jump into the backyard where there is waiting for them four men with Winchesters along a wall by an outhouse. As they make their way, some say they took their uh, boots off and were in their stocking feet. The first man at the gate, Har Harry Morris, uh, he was a law student. He was shot dead in his tracks. The fourth one in line jumped over his body and fired back. And that man's name was Henry McCarty, alias Billy Bonney. And when he fired back, the four men along the back wall ducked down and the first group made it out of that house alive and into the Bonita stream behind the McSween house and made it to safety. The second group who came out were not as lucky, but let's talk about how this all came about. This is the, of course, the big killing in the Lincoln County War. And that was started uh, earlier that year in February when the Englishman, John Tunstall, uh, was killed by a rogue element of a posse uh, that shot him down and it started the so-called Lincoln County War. Now they were, uh, in the movies, there's always uh, the law and then there's the outlaws, but the Lincoln County War is really unique because there was too much law. There were roaming gangs who had jurisdiction and had warrants for the other side and they literally would ride into camps or ranches and, and uh, tell the people that they had to join their posse at the uh, threat of a fine and it got so bad that the Las Vegas Optic reported both parties are in the field and a collision is imminent. If they should succeed in completely destroying the others the result would be hailed by all good citizens. Truer words were never spoken. Well, uh, Alexander McSween was a lawyer and he was in charge of an insurance policy, believe it or not, this is, I know this is so strange, uh, that he didn't pay and his rival, the person who uh, deserved the money, the $10,000, was Jimmy Dolan, a merchant in Lincoln, New Mexico. So Alexander McSween um, and his men were roaming the county, as I said, uh, looking for members of the other side. And finally, McSween was tired of running. And so he came to his home in the center of Lincoln, New Mexico, with approximately 40 men known loosely as the regulators, including uh, Billy the Kid. And Martin Chavez had been chosen as the leader of this group. And he was from Picasso and well-respected. And he set up a uh, defense of the McSween house um, with uh, sandbags and portholes in the walls. And uh, he stationed men around the small village. It's really only, there was only about 40 families in this small village of Lincoln. And he set up a defense perimeter so that they could defend themselves and maybe have it out once and for all. And uh, that's exactly where this went, but maybe not the way that he had planned. Uh, we needed to tell you about a couple of things. One is uh, Fort Stanton is nearby. Uh, Colonel Nathan Dudley was the commander there. And uh, the, uh, the law people in Lincoln um, besieged him and said, you need to come down and help us. We have these outlaws, the McSweens. We need to take care of them. But uh, Dudley's hands were tied because uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, the uh, president of the United States, had just signed the previous month the Posse Comitas um, Act, which said that a federal government cannot send U.S. troops to meddle into domestic affairs. So his hands were tied. He really technically could not come into Lincoln and act in a partisan manner. And uh, But what happened next is that the um, Pepin side, that's the sheriff that's on the Dolan side, uh, they tried to serve a warrant on the McSween men who were holed up in the McSween house and uh, they were fired upon, and uh, th that deputy escaped. And so then um, Pepin sent a, um, a request to Dudley and said, hey, can we borrow a howitzer so I can blow these guys out of that house? 
And Dudley said, no, you can't because of the Posse Comitas Act. Uh, but I will send down my post-surgeon to um, interview both sides and see what's really going on in Lincoln. And so uh, a, a surgeon, Apple, was sent down. He interviewed both sides. And uh, no conclusion actually happened. Uh, but and when the request for the howitzer came in, uh, Dudley sent down a black trooper uh, to uh, send his regrets that he couldn't send that. And he was fired upon by someone in the McSween house, although McSween denied it. Uh, it's probable that he was fired on. And so uh, Jimmy Dolan uh, now sent back down up there and said, uh, we need your help. And so Dudley had a meeting with uh, his officers. There were four of them. And he got them to sign a resolution that they agreed with him that he had to intercede for the protection of uh, the women and children. In fact, three Hispanic women had walked to the fort on July 19th, 1878, and had pleaded with him to come and help them regain their homes. So uh, on noon of July 19th, uh, Dudley showed up in town. He stopped at the, uh, the house, which was where uh, 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 Jimmy Dolan and his crew were. And he made a speech and said, I'm, I'm here impartially and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take sides. And I just want you to know I'm here to protect the women and children. So then him and his crew, uh, they, uh, by the way, they had a 12 pound howitzer with them, a Gatling gun with 2,000 rounds of ammunition, a company of cavalry and a company of uh, infantry and four officers, uh, approximately 35 men, enlisted men. And they went marching down the center of the street. Now, here's what happened. So as they went down the street, Pepin's men got in with the soldiers and nobody on the McSween house or any of their other uh, uh, strategic locations dared fire on the soldiers. So within the matter of minutes, as Dudley went down the street, they dropped off and were able to uh, commandeer the high spots, as it were, to control everything. The um, uh, Pepin got uh, uh, really upset and wanted to bring this to fruition. They made several demands, which uh, McSween declined. Now, now, keep this in mind. I, I just love these details in history. So at about three o'clock, um, the mailman came through and uh, everybody stopped and uh, uh, McSween wrote a note to Ash Upson, who was the postmaster in Roswell, New Mexico. And the uh, the note said, um, a dear Ash, please send me three dollars in stamps. I am OK. I suppose you hear queer versions. Right. will triumph. Isn't that incredible? And so obviously everybody read their mail they're, they're, they're Everything's quiet. And then it started to heat up again with firing became general. But then the critical thing happened. Andy Boyle, uh, who was one of the member of the Pepin Posse, he started a fire on the northwest uh, corner of the McSween house. And the McSween house was a giant rambling uh, U-shaped adobe. And on the uh, west corner uh, was a kitchen with an outdoor semi thing. And he stacked wood in there, Andy Boyle did, and started a fire. Um, they got by with this because they were having a meeting in in the living room and everybody was there to talk about what they were going to do. And that's when the fire started. Uh, most people thought that they could put the fire out, but it started to uh, burn incessantly into the beams and it started burning room by room. So then Dudley, uh, he claims in his testimony that they heard an explosion and some believe that there was a ammunition room or uh, something that with ammunition that exploded. And then the fire really accelerated. So uh, McSween, the lawyer, was uh, had his head in his hands and he uh, was worthless, basically, as he was a lawyer, not a fighter. And Billy the Kid um, said, took over and he said, we're gonna make a break. We've gotta wait for it to get dark. And so the uh, Pepin men had been down uh, uh, behind the house on the uh, east side, and there is a chicken house and an outhouse, and then an adobe wall in the back with a gate that wraps around on the east side. And so that became the target for the kid and, and his men to make it for that gate. 
that backyard was very small. There was about 10 feet between the back door of the McSween house and the fence where the Pepin men were. And the kid's objective was to make it out of there in the dark and make it to that east gate, unlatch it, and make it through. And the plan was that Harvey Morris, who was a law student for McSween, would lead that because he was the quickest. And he would open the gate, and then the others would open fire and give him cover so that they could all make it through. What actually happened is that uh, the Peppa men were waiting, and they spotted Harvey Morris at the gate and shot him dead. He actually opened the gate and then fell. And so the men behind him jumped over him, including the kid who was fourth in line. And uh, if you know anything about Billy the Kid, he was not the leader of any parade. He pulled the same thing um, at the fight in Old Fort Sumner, where uh, Pat Garrett thought he would be first in line and he wasn't. And they killed a uh, uh, Follard. Uh, followed some say, uh, and and not the kid because the kid was back in line. And the same thing happened here. He was fourth in line. He probably leapt through that gate. I call it Billy's backyard ballet. And he fired at the men. They ducked and it allowed that first group to get away free. Now the second group was not as lucky because now they're on hyper vigilance and they're ready. And the McSween group, which the second five came out the back door were fired upon, they couldn't even approach the gate out of the darkness. You have to picture this, that the guys that are on the back gate are looking into a, a fire at the top and the deep shadow with smoke coming out of the north door, the last room standing. And so they couldn't really see, and the smoke helped uh, disguise the men that were there. Uh, finally, uh, someone in the McSween group, after about three attempts to make it to the gate, uh, yelled out, I shall surrender. And uh, Robert Beckwith, who was at the back gate, said, I'm a deputy uh, U.S. Marshal, and I, I will accept your uh, surrender. And so four men uh, entered that backyard with the Winchesters drawn to go into the darkness there to accept the surrender. Big mistake. Someone in the group fired, and uh, Robert Beckwith was hit in the eye. And then the firing became general, and all of the Pepin men were shooting wildly at everybody that was uh, in the end of the darkness. In fact, it got so crazy that uh, several of the McSween men got in the chicken house, uh, probably trying to escape or make it through. And so they brought a log in and they jammed it into the side and then put a Winchester in there and just fired uh, willy nilly until all of the uh, breathing stopped. Now, what's incredible is um, all of the men were left there and they went and got two fiddlers to party and to celebrate they had uh, got these uh, bad guys uh and um uh at, at around midnight they went off they were all drunk and they left and then miraculously one of the bodies started to move and then it started to crawl and it crawled about a half mile down to a relative's house and that's uh Eugenio salazar who was the um one of the McSween men miraculously survived. He was shot twice and he played dead and had to endure them playing music while he was laying there in pain. Uh, but he not only survived, he lived until 1936. Now, the kid and his cohorts, they um, uh, were on horse. They were they made it out alive, but all of their horses and all their gear that were down at the Ellis store were all captured, so now they were not without horses, and so they had to stop volunteers uh, around the surrounding area to try to uh, uh, become uh, horseback again. So now you know the real story about what happened, and I got to say that when Billy the Kid jumped out of that burning house, he became the most famous man in New Mexico, and three years later, just down the street, by the way, when he escaped the courthouse and killed his two guards, he became one of the most famous outlaws in U.S. history. But that's another story for another day.